Hi everyone, my name is Rob Wars. I'm a, I'm a writer and I'm a performer producer. Um, and I'm here today to, to do a lesson about LGBT history. Um, some of you may or may not know, February is LGBT history month, uh, so it is on the horizon. Um, before we go anywhere else, I guess one of the main questions people will have at this stage is, well, what does LGBT mean? And we're going to go into that. Before we do, um, I want to go through a few other general terms that we're going to use in this class that are associated to the subject at hand. Um, so I will go through the acronym LGBT. But first, I want to get you guys thinking. Um, I'm going to give you one minute to write down as many things you can think of that make up your identity, things that make up you. Now, don't think too hard about it. Uh, I am going to play along as well with this lovely little whiteboard I got for four quid off Amazon. Um, so write down, give you just one minute. I'll start the time now. Um, as many things as you can think of that make up your identity. There we go. And we've got five seconds to go. Okay, let's call that time right there. What have we got? Okay, well, I'll talk you through what I had written down there. Um, so my six things were male, as in that is my gender, that is uh, the sex that I was I was born with. I am I am a man. Um, Northern. I'm from just outside Liverpool, hence the funny accent, which you can probably tell. Um, that, that is quite important to me as well. Everton, the third one there. Now, I can't deny it. I do love football. And for my sins, I am an Everton fan. Um, maybe for some of you, sport is quite an important part of that identity, be it football, will be cricket, uh, whatever that is. I've also put down the arts. And uh, now the arts... Is, is important to me. It is a part of who I am. I'm, I'm as I say to you at the start, I'm a writer and I'm an actor and I'm a, I'm a producer of, of, of theatre. Um, so I am quite creative. That does make up a big part of me. Family, as I'm sure it is with, with, with some of you, family is, is very important to me. And the last one there is LGBT. So I identify as a gay man. Um, and being LGBT is, is a part of my identity. And we'll come on to that. As you can see, just from that very, very basic exercise, identity is, is a collection of characteristics that make up who you are. Now, they can be obvious physical traits or they can be things that are important to you, whether it's, you know, in my case, my football team, my, my career. Um, I want to talk about two other important concepts um, that are going to be crucial for, for this lesson. And these are both things that make up part of your identity. Now, we touched on the first one when we did that exercise there, and that is gender. Now, gender relates to the identifying characteristics of a person's sex. Now, sex at birth, as we know, male or female, man or woman. And gender are the traits that you associate with being male or female. The majority of the population will identify as one or the other. Um, now, there are some people who, who don't identify as just one or the other. Remember that, because we will touch on that a little bit later. The other key concept uh, to get your head around is, is, is sexuality. And sexuality, another part of your identity, and it relates to who you are attracted to. Um, someone who is heterosexual or straight is attracted to somebody of the opposite sex. Somebody who is homosexual, gay is attracted to the same sex. 
So with that in mind, let, let's go back to those four letters then, um, LGBT. And I've picked up some, some famous examples um, and I'm hoping that you'll know who they are. Um, L, we've got L, um, lesbian. That is a, a woman who is attracted to uh, another woman. Now, some famous examples of that would include um, the talk show host, Ellen DeGeneres, um, the model and actress, uh, Samira Wiley, and the YouTuber, and I hope I've got this right, Jojo Sua. Probably haven't, have I? Not really big on my YouTubers, but, but there we go. Um, G is gay, being attracted to someone of the same sex, or as we said earlier, homosexual. Some examples would include uh, lead singer of years and years, Ollie Alexander, uh, the actor uh, Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, that's Luke Evans, uh, and the rapper Frank Ocean are all uh, gay men in their case. Uh, B stands for bisexual, which is being attracted to both sexes, male and female. Some examples of that would include the uh, singer Miley Cyrus, another YouTuber, Lily Singh, and the actor Jared Leto. T comes, uh, stands for transgender. Someone who's transgender is um, biologically born as, as one sex, but they identify as the other sex. Transgender people feel they have been born into the wrong physical body. The opposite of transgender is cisgender. Cisgender means that you identify as the same gender that you were born into. For example, I am cisgender, I was born a man, and I identify as a man. Someone who is transgender was born male or female, but will identify as the opposite of that gender. There can be a misconception that all transgender people have what we call sex reassignment surgery, but that simply isn't true. You can be transgender without making those physical changes to your body. Some examples of, of famous transgender people would include um, actors Elliot Page, um, some, some of you may know uh, from Inception, uh, and Laverne Cox, uh, and also Keeping Up With The Kardashians star Caitlyn Jenner, and before you say anything, no, I'm not too old to know who that is, thank you. Now occasionally you will see other letters being added to those four. Remember earlier we said that some people do not identify as one gender. Now these people are called non-binary or gender fluid. A couple of ex examples uh, would be Sam Smith, the singer, and Ruby Rose, uh, the actor. They identify as, as non-binary or as gender fluid. You will sometimes see other letters uh, or signs being added to, to LGBT. So for example, you might see LGBTQ. Now in this case, the Q stands for queer. The word queer is a blanket term really, that, that covers everyone from a, a gender or a sexual or sexuality minority group. And some people prefer to identify as queer. Some of you may be thinking, hang on, isn't queer an insult that's used towards gay people? And historically, that is true. It, it, it certainly was. But nowadays, if someone from a, a gender or a sexuality minority group uses the word queer to describe themselves, what they're doing is they're taking the power away from the insult. They're basically saying, I can't be hurt by you calling me that offensively because I use that word now to describe myself. You may sometimes see LGBT plus or LGBTQ plus and the plus sign, I guess it's just a, an alternative way of, of saying anyone else who feels like they fit into this social group, this, um, but perhaps they don't immediately think of themselves as being LGBT or, or, or Q. Okay, I appreciate that that is, is a lot to take in there, especially if you're hearing these, these terms for the first time. I have, a I have attached a glossary with, with this class, and that glossary includes all the terms we've just been through, and a couple more as well. Um, perhaps you can you can pause this video right now just to go over that glossary, maybe just to help absolutely crystallize some of those definitions in your head. And if you are still a bit unsure on, on what some of them mean, you can, of course, use the magic of Google anytime you'd like to um, to find out a bit more there. 
I'm going to have a quick sip of tea. And we're going to crack on um, with the early history of LGBT identity. So the most important thing to emphasize here is that whilst the LGBT rights movement is a 20th century thing, it would be wrong to assume that LGBT people have only sort of popped up over the past 200 years. They've been around for centuries, really. Um, there have been gay people, bisexual people, trans people since the dawn of civilization. And every age, you know, has notable examples. I've picked out a few. Um, Alexander the Great uh, had a male partner. Uh, the poet Sappho, known as the poetess, uh, she was bisexual. And the Roman emperor, Elagabalus is said to have dressed in women's clothing and preferred to be called a lady rather than a lord. However, what has changed over the centuries is the treatment of LGBT, LGBT people in this country and, and, and around the world. Let's focus specifically on, on the UK now, which is the lens through which we will look at a lot of the LGBT history in, in this class. Um, the outlawing uh, of gay men first occurred in around 1533 when the Parliament of King Henry VIII made male homosexuality illegal. It was punishable by death right up until 1861 and the Offences Against the Person Act when it was repealed uh, and changed to 10 years in prison. However, in the Criminal Law Act just over 20 years later in 1885, um, the prosecution of gay men became even more severe, as did the persecution. People could be arrested if they were assumed to be gay without any real evidence. There was a very famous case uh, in the late 19th century, uh, the case of the Irish writer Oscar Wilde. You may know the importance of being earnest, very funny, very witty man, um, genius in many ways. And Oscar Wilde was sent to, to Reading jail after he was found guilty of gross indecency uh, owing to a relationship that he had with Lord Alfred Douglas who was the son of the Marquis of Queensbury. Now many people told Wilde to essentially hide from the truth about his homosexuality but Wilde was defiant. In a letter he wrote from jail that became known as De Profundis Wilde said, to regret one's own experiences is to arrest one's own development. To deny one's own experiences is to put a lie into the lips of one's own life. It is no less than a denial of the soul. Now, Wilde referred to his love with Lord Alfred Douglas famously, um, who was nicknamed Bosey, as the love that dare not speak its name. This was an accurate depiction of, of how homosexual people felt at the time. And for many decades to come, they dare not speak the name of the person they love. For society had, had forbidden it. Wilde was sent to prison. Two years of hard labour, which was the strongest punishment at the time. And all of this for the so-called crime of loving another man. Interestingly, there's never been a law passed in this country that's made female homosexuality illegal. The closest we came was in the 1920s. Parliament considered it, but it was rejected for two main reasons. The first one was that they were worried by passing a law against female homosexuality, it would encourage more women to start practicing it. I mean, you know, work, work that one out. And they only believed the very small percentage of the female population were homosexual, whereas they believed to be a much greater percentage of the male population. We'll move now into the post-war era. Um, just after World War II, let's talk a bit about transgender identities, because they were starting to become uh, more visible in the UK in the first half of the 20th century. Michael Dillon became the first transgender man to undergo gender reassignment, sex reassignment surgery, forgive me. Uh, and in his book, Self, a study in endocrinology in 1946, he describes his journey from Laura which was his birth identity, to Michael, his new identity. And I picked out this quote because I think I really like this quote. It says, where the mind cannot be made to fit the body, 
the body should be made to fit approximately at any race to the mind. Roberta Cowell was a, a fighter pilot and a war veteran turned racing car driver, became the first transgender woman to undergo surgery in 1951 in the UK, I should specify. Uh, and these examples, as I say, are, are UK based. But there were other examples uh, earlier in the 20th century in Europe. We had the authors uh, Karl M. Baer and Dora, and Dora Richter in Germany, and the painter Lily Elber in Denmark. Now, some of you may know uh, Lily Elber. Uh, Lily was the subject of the 2000 book, The Danish Girl, which was turned into a movie in 2015. <clears throat> it might be a mistake to assume that Yes, the, there were trans figures in public, and that is, of course, always a great thing. But it would be a mistake to assume that this was genuine, genuine progress for the trans community, because really a lot of people from that community were hidden away from mainstream society. Their battle for equality um, still to this day ha has got further to go um, than it has done for, for lesbian, gay and bisexual people. We'll come on to that a little bit more later on, um, but certainly some positive signs, early 20th century um, on, 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 on the trans movement. We'll move into the 1950s now. We'll, we'll talk about um, Alan Turing and uh, the Wolf Ending Report. So perhaps the most famous case of the illegality of homosexuality is the case of Alan Turing. Now, some of you may be familiar with his story, as you may have seen the Benedict Cumberbatch movie, The Imitation Game, about his life. But for those who haven't, let me go over it now. So Turing was a mathematician and a computer scientist. He's considered one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, and he developed one of the world's first computers in Manchester in the early 1950s. Because of his brilliance, he worked for the government during the Second World War trying to break coded messages uh, that the German military were, were sending to each other that had been intercepted by the British. They just needed someone to decode them to work out what the Germans were, were, were planning during the war. Turing and his team famously cracked the German Enigma code, and that helped to shorten the war in Europe and prevent millions of more lives being lost. Alan Turing was a genius and he was a war hero. However, Turing was never celebrated in that way because he was gay. In 1952, he was arrested for homosexual acts and was given two options. He could either serve time in prison or he could undergo a radical new treatment that scientists were experimenting with at the time as a means to cure the gay. The treatment involved undergoing a change to his hormones and the loss of his libido. He no longer was attracted to anyone. It was designed to make him no longer attracted to men. It made Turing impotent. It was a brutal treatment, the sort of thing you'd expect from the worst kind of treatment to animals. It left Turing incredibly depressed. As he said, no doubt I shall emerge from it all a different man but quite who I've not found out. Turing was found dead by his housekeeper in June of 1954, having committed suicide by cyanide poisoning. Instead of being celebrated as a great war hero, he was left to die in shame. And, and, and shame was the norm for many LGBT people at the time, whose society essentially disowned. They were illegal, they were outlaws. Now, in 1957, a key report on homosexuality in the UK called the Wolf Enden Report made a crucial finding. Until then, people who were gay were basically thought of as being ill. But the Wolf Enden Report changed that. It said that being gay should no longer be considered a criminal offence. Homosexual behaviour between consenting adults in private should no longer be considered a criminal offence. However, there was a problem. The deeply conservative UK government under the Prime Minister Harold Macmillan did not act on the findings. They were essentially being told what to do, but didn't choose to do anything about it. 
Let's move on to the 1960s now and the birth of a movement. Now, some of you may have studied the 1960s in history. It was a very politically active decade for a lot of people in the UK and the US. And as I say, we are framing a lot of this lesson around um, experiences in the West. It was the birth and growth of the civil rights movement. So in America, you had activists like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X calling for greater equality for black people. King led a huge march on Washington DC, delivered his very famous I Have a Dream speech in which he spoke about living in a country where his children are not judged for the color of the skin, but by the quality of their character. And that one day they would all be free at last. Feminism, continued to rise through the decade and there was great progression in women's rights. The contraceptive pill was introduced in the US in 1960 and it was made available on the NHS in the UK in 1961. We had the Abortion Act of 1967 which legalised abortion in England, Scotland and Wales on certain grounds by registered practitioners. Steady progress, nothing dramatic there. Uh, in America, the feminist movement demanding equal rights for women took off. The famous burn your bra slogan was born. In one example, the women's liberation movement literally burned their bras outside the 1968 Miss America contest in protest of what they perceived to be a, a very male dominant society. But it wasn't until later in the decade that we saw what many people believe to be the start of the LGBT rights movement. Now, there's two key events that took place on either side of the Atlantic. First in the UK, we had the Sex Offences Act of 1967. Now this basically took up the recommendations of the Wolf Emden report that we mentioned earlier, and it decriminalized homosexual acts between consenting men aged 21 years old. Why the change? Well. 1964 had seen a political shift in the UK. The Conservative government of Alec Douglas Home had been replaced by a more socially liberal Labour government led by Harold Wilson. This law came into effect immediately in England and Wales, but not until 1980 in Scotland and 1982 in Northern Ireland. It's really important to state that despite the legislation coming into place, attitudes towards LGBT people were not good, really. You can change laws, but it's harder to change people's minds. For decades, people had grown up believing it was wrong to be LGBT. A lot of LGBT people felt this themselves, and sadly, suicide rates have been relatively high amongst LGBT people. And a lot of this is to do with the treatment that they have received from society in general over the decades. Now, the law now removed the criminal tag in the late 60s from people who were gay, it would take much longer to change attitudes towards LGBT people. The trans community faced a momentous judgment in a court case in 1969 involving the British aristocrat Arthur Corbett, who in 1963 had married April Ashley, a successful model who had appeared in Vogue. Ashley was a transgender woman who had undergone sex reassignment surgery in 1960. Corbett was aware Ashley was trans. After Corbett and Ashley's marriage broke down, Ashley's lawyers wrote to Corbett in 1967, appealing for maintenance payments that were the legal right of women at the time. Now, in response, Corbett demanded the marriage annulled. This effectively makes a legal declaration that that marriage never happened and would mean that Corbett avoided having to make those payments. In a case that became known as Corbett versus Corbett, the court granted an annulment in February 1971 on the basis that Ashley was biologically born male. The unofficial changing of birth certificates that had been going on in the UK for, for a while ceased as a result. And this set a precedence for the trans community for decades they were legally unable to officially change the gender assigned to them on their birth certificate. And as a result, they had very little rights. For a lot of people, the LGBT rights movement started in New York in 1969. There was a major incident in a bar in the Greenwich Village area of Manhattan 
called the Stonewall Inn. Now, the Stonewall was a bar that was frequented by many people from the LGBT community who, generally speaking, could meet up here without harassment. Now, police would occasionally raid these bars, arrest people, take the money from the bar. It was against the law for men to dance with other men or to dress up in the clothes of the opposite gender. Both of these things were happening at Stonewall. There was a feeling amongst the community, why are the police so determined to shut us down? Why are they raiding us? There's so much crime going on in the city. People are dying. People are being burgled. A lot going on. Frankly, don't they have better things to do? On the night of the 28th of June, 1969, nine policemen entered the Stonewall. They arrested the staff. They roughed up customers. It was the third raid in Greenwich Village in a short period of time. And a lot of people were fed up. They were fed up. They felt they were being unfairly victimized by the police. Quite frankly, they were sick and tired of being targeted because of their sexuality. As the police officers led some of the people they'd arrested back into the back of the police van, uh, a group of, of um, customers at the Stonewall and, and, and passers-by began to jeer. They jostled, they threw bottles and they threw debris at the police and things escalated fast. There were soon 400 people rioting. The police had barricaded themselves into the bar and they had to call for backup. The riots continued for a further five nights Enough was enough. This is widely regarded as the birthplace of the LGBT rights movement. Sylvia Rivera, who was a prominent trans rights activist uh, at the time, she put it best, and I love this quote. She says, I'm not missing a minute of this. It's the revolution. The events in Greenwich Village that night inspired many LGBT people around the world to fight for their rights to equality. Let's look at that fight uh, a little bit more now. We move into the 1970s. Immediately following the riots, the Gay Liberation Front or the GLF was set up by Marsha P. Johnson and others. Now, now Johnson is a, an enormous figure of the time. She uh, really is. Uh, Johnson, a black drag queen, um, uh, and who, who was at the Stonewall riots. The GLF established itself in the UK in 1970. It was a political movement that aimed to raise awareness of the inequality that existed in society and the mistreatment of LGBT people. Uh, and here's a quote, um, essentially from the manifesto. We do not intend to ask for anything. We intend to stand firm and assert our basic rights. If this involves violence, it will not be we who initiate this, but those who attempt to stand in our way to freedom. An important point to make here is that both Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were there at the very start of it all, fighting for the rights of gay, lesbian and bisexual people, even though as trans people they were and are still to this day unfairly treated as lesser than by wider society. Sometimes people question why there is a T in LGBT, because, you know, being gay or bisexual is an issue of sexuality and being trans is more an issue of gender. Well, for me, it's this. It's, it's because lesbian, gay and bisexual people have always stood together with trans people throughout history. And nowhere was this stronger than at Stonewall at the birth of the movement. By 1971, the GLF held weekly meetings of two to three hundred people, organised the UK's first ever Pride March in London in 1972. This was inspired by the US, where Pride March, the first in the world, had been arranged in LA in 1970 by a bisexual woman named Brenda Howard. Pride marches are still a very important aspect of LGBT culture today. And Leicester has got its very own Pride. And currently it's scheduled to take place on the 4th of September this year. Let's hope we're, we're, we're through the worst of this pandemic by then. Eh? Now, eventually the group fractured, the GLF, and numerous other groups were formed in its wake. These included the Manchester-based Campaign for Homosexual Equality, the CHE. Stonewall, named after the place of the riots, was established in London. And Stonewall is still operating to this day and, and continues to go from strength to strength. In Leicester, there was the Leicester Gay Liberation Front, which set up a gay line providing information for the gay community. 
They ran a local newspaper even because at the time, the Leicester Mercury refused to advertise their services. Gayline would later receive national lottery funding and is still going today. And it's something that Leicester can be incredibly proud of. Back over the Atlantic now to, to California in 1977. Um, Harvey Milk became the first openly gay politician to be elected to office when he was elected to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. Huge, pivotal moment in, the, in LGBT history, this. Um, around the world, a lot more uh, homosexual people started coming out of the closet. This is an expression that means telling other people about their sexuality. And activists like Harvey Milk believed that this was crucial in the fight for equality. And as he put it, burst down those closet doors once and for all and stand up and start to fight. Sip of tea, as you do. Uh, Harvey Milk uh, sadly was assassinated by a fellow politician named Dan White. White was homophobic, that is to say, a person who hates gay people. To this day, Harvey Milk remains an icon of LGBT history for his bravery and his pioneering spirit. Also in the 1970s, that there was progress around the world. Sweden became the first country in the world to allow trans people to legally change their gender, a breakthrough moment in the trans rights movement globally, and a gay pride event in 1978 in Sydney, Australia, known as Mardi Gras, the rainbow flag was first used as the symbol of the LGBT community that we know today. As you can tell by now, there's a strong movement developing for, for LGBT equality. But in the 1980s, the LGBT community faced its gravest challenge yet. HIV, which stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, it lowers the immune system in the body, making you more susceptible to other diseases. AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, is the name given to such a disease that infects the body due to being HIV positive. So essentially your immune system was so weak, you could die of a wide range of illnesses that you might previously be cured of. It spread in a number of ways, uh, contaminated blood transfusions, hypodermic needles, but primarily it's sexually transmitted. It's important to make the point that it does not only affect homosexual people. But what we started to see during an epidemic in the 1980s is that it disproportionately affected gay men. We saw more cases in the gay male community in the UK than in any other communities. In December 1981, the first man in the UK had died of the disease and soon it became a full-blown crisis and epidemic. There are actually some similarities with, with the coronavirus pandemic we've been living through recently because there was a lot of confusion. Nobody was sure at first what it was, where had it come from, and crucially, how do you treat it? AIDS was a killer and it would take out many gay men and it didn't care how old you were or how fit and healthy you'd previously been. I cannot overstate just how scary it was. And part of that was because the complete lack of empathy shown towards a lot of gay men at the time. I'll be honest, a lot of people felt because they were gay, they deserved it and they deserved to die. Gay men were stigmatized, shunned by wider society. There was a lot of scaremongering going on in the media in this country. Uh, they were targeting and vilifying gay men. I'll give you two examples from, from newspapers here in the mid 1980s. I'm not gonna say anything, I'll just let you read these headlines so you can see just how bad it was. Not only were gay men having to deal with the deaths of friends and lovers, as well as the total fear of having AIDS themselves, but now they were faced with the ignorance and the nastiness of the media and many in wider society, as well as, they were, as what they perceived to be a totally unsympathetic government. So the first half of the 80s were terrifying for many gay men, but, but by the mid 80s, hope was on the horizon. 1986 saw the developments of the first uh, HIV drug, AZT, and also uh, Zydovudine. 
The drugs were approved and distribution started, distribution, I should say, started in 1987. The first needle exchange in the UK was in Dundee. By 1989, scientific evidence showed that the drugs were starting to work and the corner was being turned. As with many other things in life, awareness of certain issues is raised by the involvement of high profile figures and celebrities. And, and this was also the case with the AIDS crisis. In July 1985, it was announced that Rock Hudson, a Hollywood star of the 50s and 60s that nobody knew was gay, had AIDS and he died several months later. It was a major moment because the stigma of the time was awful. The comedian Joan Rivers said, Rock's admission is a horrendous way to bring AIDS to the attention of the American public, but by doing so, Rock in his life has helped millions in the process. What Rock has done takes true courage. In 1987, Diana, Princess of Wales, who was married to our future king, Prince Charles, was photographed shaking hands with an AIDS patient on a hospital visit. And this helped to break down the inaccurate assumption many people had at the time that you could become HIV positive simply through touching another person. This was something the world had never dealt with before and misinformation was allowed to spread as a result. 1988 marked the first World AIDS Day on December the 1st. This event is still commemorated to this day with the red ribbon as a symbol of remembrance. Maybe you've seen this before. In 1991, Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, announced that he had AIDS. And the next day, his death was also announced. It was incredibly shocking. And because of how high profile he was, it continued to raise awareness of HIV AIDS to non-LGBT people around the world which even into the early 1990s, it was still stigmatized. Also in 1991, Magic Johnson, a heterosexual basketball player in the US, declared himself to be HIV positive. And this began to remove that misconception people had that it was only gay men who could be HIV positive with you know, some media outlets, as we saw with earlier headlines, you know, the gay plague of the 1980s. Activism in response, then. Let's have a look at that. Uh, in response to the AIDS crisis and the lack of information and support from the governments in the US of Ronald Reagan from 1980 to 1988 and George H.W. Bush from 1989 to 1992, and the UK uh, under Margaret Thatcher, both of whom were socially conservative and perceived as lacking empathy towards the LGBT community, many protest and activist groups were formed. ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, in 1987, it was formed at the Lesbian and Gay Community Center in New York in response to the crisis. A political movement demanding action, enough was enough. Larry Kramer, a famous playwright, was involved, along with our friend Marsha P. Johnson from Stonewall. They weren't going to stand quietly by when people were dying. They were fighting for their lives. Their slogan, silence equals death. ACT UP would often perform stunts in order to capture media attention to raise awareness. One of the great stunts was, was stopping traffic and protest about the lack of government response to the crisis and the fact that a lot of pharmaceutical companies who were in charge of the drugs and distributing the medication were trying to make a profit on AIDS medication, often making it too expensive for people who were suffering with the illness. The UK branch of ACT UP was set up by Peter Tatchell, who to this day continues to campaign proudly and fiercely for LGBT rights globally. Other organisations included Queer Nation, set up in 1990, and the Lesbian Avengers, set up in 1992. What a great name. And on this point, it's really important to mention that despite HIV and AIDS predominantly affecting gay men, Many, many women, gay or straight, stood by the community throughout this awful time. And that's one piece of history that should never be forgotten. Charities were, were set up as well. We have the Terence Higgins Trust in London, named after Terence Higgins, who, who died of AIDS in 1982. And in Manchester, there was the George House Trust established in 1985. And these charities still exist to this day and have been a huge help to many HIV positive people in the UK. Phone services were established. People could ring up anonymously and get information about the virus, the developing treatment. Um, and there was a widespread movement for as many people to take an HIV test as possible. 
Uh, and that is a message that absolutely continues to this day. So as you can see, out of the horrors of the AIDS crisis, a sense of community response and activism was ignited. A generation lost their lives to this awful disease. It's important that we never forget them. Since the epidemic began in the early 80s, 30, over 32 million people worldwide have died from HIV AIDS. It's, it's a shocking number. Today, there are an estimated 105,000 people who are HIV positive in the UK. The advancements in science since the 80s and the better medication that is now available means that we can control the virus and people can live a normal life with HIV uh, who are HIV positive. In 2019, the NHS made available a breakthrough drug known as PrEP, which if taken regularly can prevent someone from becoming HIV positive. The other major obstacle the LGBT community had to overcome in the 1980s was Section 28 of the Local Government Act of 1988, passed by the government uh, of the Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher. Section 28 stated that a local authority shall not intentionally promote homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality or promoting the teaching in any school of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. This essentially meant that places like schools could not discuss homosexuality. Libraries were not allowed to have books that promoted homosexuality. This class that we're having right now would have been illegal. Just let that one sink in. Combined with the government's poor response to the AIDS crisis, this made worse the feeling within the LGBT community that the government didn't care about them. But as happened many times before, adversity made the movement stronger. Peter Tatchell, who we mentioned earlier, would establish outrage in response to the legislation. A group of lesbians invaded a BBC News studio as it went live on air to protest. 20,000 people took to the streets of Manchester to march in protest. And in a BBC radio discussion on the matter, the actor Ian McKellen, that's Gandalf or Magneto to you and me, came out as gay in order to protest the law, to raise awareness and visibility. It remains one of the most controversial pieces of legislation that the, uh, that the UK government has ever, any UK government has ever passed. And the issue itself divided the Conservative Party long after Margaret Thatcher was gone. As late as 1999, the Conservative leader, William Hague, sacked one of his ministers for publicly declaring that he was against Section 28. Activism also existed within the trans community uh, throughout the 80s. Specifically, the campaigning group Press for Change demanded trans people be allowed to legally change gender and also to marry. The group took several cases to the European Court of Human Rights. Most famously, in 1986, trans man Mark Rees complained he was being denied gender recognition before the law. But the years of campaigning were starting to work. In 1996, the last year of John Major's Conservative government, a crucial breakthrough for trans people, with a case in Cornwall whereby a trans woman was sacked after informing her employer that she had undergone sex reassignment surgery. The court ruled that this was unfair dismissal. It was the first time the court had ruled against discrimination based on gender identity in the UK. Big, big deal. Section 28 was eventually repealed, in other words, gotten rid of in 2001 under Tony Blair's Labour government, which had finally defeated the Conservatives at the 1997 general election. Now, the repeal of Section 28 was one of many changes that took place in this country under this more socially liberal Labour government. And amongst others, there was the Adoption and Children Act of 2002 declared a child could be adopted by a single person or an unmarried couple, paving the way for gay couples who could not be married to adopt. The Sexual Offences Amendment Act of 2000 made the age of consent the same for homosexual and heterosexual people. That would be 16 in England, Ireland and Wales. The ban on gay men and women serving in the military was lifted in 2000 and later extended to include trans people. 
The Gender Recognition Act of 2004 allowed people to legally change their gender with a gender recognition certificate two years after transitioning and present them with a new birth certificate. It doesn't require a person to have undergone sex reassignment surgery, but it does require a medical evaluation to determine the gender. This act wasn't perfect. However, uh, we will come on to that a bit later. There was the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 2008. They're big words, aren't they? Uh, it granted lesbian couples who wanted in vitro fertilization, otherwise known as IVF, uh, which is treatment so they can give birth. They were granted equal birth rights to mothers in heterosexual relationships. The Equality Act of 2010 formed the basis of anti-discrimination law in the UK, and it removed certain loopholes that employers uh, might look to if they didn't want to hire anyone who was LGBT, as well as many obstacles that were in place for LGBT people accessing both public or private services. It also it also stopped schools refusing to admit trans pupils. That was a, a big step forward. The Equality Act also changed uh, the law. So gender reassignment was now a protected characteristic, giving more rights to transgender people. The years of campaigning had struck a chord with the public and the politicians of this country in the late 90s and early noughties. LGBT people, LGBT people were becoming more open and visible in the public eye, as well as gay and lesbian television presenters, singers and actors coming out. We were slowly starting to see trans characters appear on television. And perhaps the most high profile ex example of this was Julie Hesmanholch, who played trans woman Hayley Cropper in Coronation Street. There was, however, one major barrier that still stood in the way, and that was the issue of marriage. Now, marriage equality uh, has been a big issue over the past 20 years. The first steps towards marriage equality came with the Civil Partnerships Act of 2004. A civil partnership is a legally recognised relationship between two people that gives the couple the same rights as a married couple in a lot of areas, and these included inheritance rights on the death of one member of the couple, social security and pension benefits, full life insurance in the event of a partner's death, and recognition as next of kin if a partner had to go into hospital. Civil partnerships did, however, differ to marriages in the following ways. A same-sex couple in a civil partnership cannot legally refer to their partner as a husband or a wife. A civil partnership ceremony is not the same as a wedding. It is not permitted to take place in a religious building. Civil partnership agreements were signed by local councillors, not uh, the church. There's no religious connotations to a civil partnership. Adultery cannot be used as valid grounds to seek to dissolve, to end a civil partnership, as it can be for a divorce. Initially, civil partnerships were only for same-sex couples, this did change in 2019. Now, straight couples can have civil partnerships. And if a married person wanted to change their gender, they had to divorce or annul their marriage in order to gain the gender recognition certificate. And then they had to remarry and or enter into a new civil partnership. Now, this changed. Uh, all of it changed. 2013, when the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition government under the Prime Minister David Cameron, passed the Marriage Act, which finally allowed same-sex couples to marry in England and Wales, and in 2014 in Scotland. Because there's a slightly different political setup uh, in Northern Ireland, it took them a little bit longer, but it finally came through in January 2020. Through this law, it also became possible for a spouse to legally change their gender without having to get a divorce or end civil partnership officially have their gender re reassigned and then have to marry or, or get into or, or have another civil partnership. The Alan Turing law, let's talk about that. In the Police and Crime Act of 2017, passed by the Conservative government of Theresa May, there was an important, important amnesty law known as the Alan Turing law. It was an official pardon by the UK government to all the gay men who were cautioned under that historic legislation that we talked about earlier. Um, that, that, that basically meant being gay was, was a criminal offence. 
Now, it's important to note that some men have refused that pardon. They see a pardon as a suggestion that they had committed a crime. You know, I, I pardon you for committing that crime. And rightfully so, a lot of men feel like, well, I didn't commit a crime. What I want is an apology from the government. <clears throat> Let's talk about an issue that is delicate. It is still to this day is um, tricky to, to, to talk about, but, but let's talk about it. It's, it's the issue of religion and sexuality. It's important to note that religious venues can still opt out of performing a same sex marriage. And currently the Church of England and Wales are, are banned technically from doing so. It's a tricky issue in society today, and it's still a major barrier to full equality on LGBT rights is that of religious freedom versus LGBT equality. Without doubt, many religious organizations and people have been very positive in favor of the LGBT community. And it's really important to, to state that. Some, by no means all, but, but some religious people and religious institutions can still discriminate against the LGBT community under the protection uh, of religious freedom that we have in the UK. Now, perhaps the most infamous example of this in recent years involved Asher's Bakery in Northern Ireland, ran by a heterosexual couple, Daniel and Amy MacArthur. And the MacArthur's refused to make a cake with a slogan written in icing that supported same-sex marriage, claiming it was at odds with their beliefs. Gareth Lee, who was the man who'd asked for the cake, sued the bakery for discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. Initially, a judge ruled that the bakery had discriminated against Mr. Lee. But when the MacArthur's appealed, it went all the way to the UK Supreme Court, who in 2018 ruled that the bakery's actions were not discriminatory. Easy for you to say. Gareth Lee and his lawyers are appealing at the European Court of Human Rights. It's gone right the way to the European Court of Human Rights. And we await the ruling on this. It's quite remarkable that a case in which essentially somebody was looking to spend £36.50 on a cake with Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street saying they support gay marriage has gone all the way to the highest of courts. But it is a great example of just how delicate this conversation is and, and I suspect will continue to be in the decades to come. You may remember right back at the start of this lesson, we talked about uh, gender fluid and non-binary people, people who don't identify as, as only one gender. Let's have a look at their rights then in the current situation. So birth certificates and passports only allow for male and female gender. It doesn't allow for people who identify as gender fluid or non-binary. Uh, this has changed in, in other countries. Canada, for instance, um, those people can now identify with an X on, on such legal documents. There's an ongoing debate in the UK at the moment over the recognition uh, of gender fluid and non-binary people's rights and, and of a new pronoun whereby rather than identifying as he or she, non-binary or, or gender fluid people, can identify as they. There are, however, no legal protections on this. And maybe that's you know somewhere where we need to go in the future. So in conclusion, it is absolutely fair to say that LGBT rights have come on leaps and bounds over the past 100 years. Not only have laws changed, but attitudes and mindsets crucially have changed. More people than ever before are open about their LGBT identity, and there are more openly LGBT figures in the public eye than there ever have been. It's also very important to note though that the improvements in LGBT rights we've discussed, primarily the, the, the great leaps forward have, have come for lesbian, gay and bisexual people, both in the law and I think in the eyes of wider society. There's still a lot of discrimination out there, I feel, towards the trans community. Let's have a quick look at what's happened over the past four years. America, for example, one of the first things Donald Trump did in 2017 when he became president was to ban trans people from serving in the military. In 2020, he also scrapped a lot of protections that were in place for trans people when it came to healthcare, housing, employment. Only last week, new president Joe Biden had to reverse a lot of these laws with executive orders. That the legislation that Donald Trump passed didn't just come from nowhere. 
it came from a social movement out there that exists that is still very anti-trans. In this country too, plans had been developing from 2016 onwards to allow transgender people to self-identify. That is to say that they no longer require the assessment of a medical body to grant them that gender recognition certificate we talked about earlier. But in 2020, the government of Boris Johnson scrapped these plans, meaning transgender people still require the approval of others to legally determine their gender. Now, a fresh argument has emerged over the past few years uh, between certain cisgendered women and trans women over access to what is known as single sex spaces, women's toilets, for example. The law currently allows female identifying people into single sex spaces, but the backlash from the likes of Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling want this change to exclude trans women. That is an argument and a debate that is ongoing. Today, it's estimated approximately 5% of the UK population are homosexual, 0.5% are trans. In 2015, ILGA Europe, which is a major LGBT group, scored the UK highest in Europe on LGBT rights with 86%. However, by 2020, the UK had dropped down to ninth place with 66%, primarily because of the difficulties and discrimination that trans people, uh, non-binary people, gender fluid people still face. So it's important to reiterate that just because rights are won, as we've seen throughout this lesson, it doesn't mean they can't also be lost. And I think that that drop in rating from the ILGA Europe demonstrates that. It's important to remember also this class is focused primarily on the advancement of the LGBT rights movement in the UK and the US. Worldwide, we still have 72 countries with severe anti-LGBT laws and 12 countries can still issue the death penalty for being gay. The fight to both maintain and improve LGBT equality goes on. That's the lesson. So thank you very much uh, for watching this and I, and I hope that you've, you've taken something from it. As I say, I've attached the glossary uh, there, uh, which will uh, include a lot of the terms that we talked about. Uh, and I'll also uh, include um, the lesson notes uh, in an email that goes out uh, with, with this lesson. Um, thank you very much and, um, and take care. Bye bye.